Welcome back. Today, we're running through a clinical flow where every second counts, assessing a suspected pulmonary embolism. It's one of those diagnoses you just can't afford to miss. Yeah. We're talking about a blockage in the pulmonary artery. And that blockage is usually a clot that's traveled from somewhere else, right? Exactly. Most of the time, it's a thrombus that breaks off from the deep veins in the leg, you know, the iliac, femoral, or popliteal veins. So when that clot lodges in the lungs, what's the immediate physiological crisis? Why does the body react so violently? Well, it's a two-part problem. First, gas exchange breaks down. You get this uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. Meaning air is coming in, but the blood can't get to it. Right. So you're increasing dead space and dropping blood oxygen levels. And the second part of that problem is the heart. Yes. And this is what can be so lethal. The blockage skyrockets the resistance in the pulmonary vessels. So the right ventricle is trying to pump against a wall. A brick wall. And that massive afterload can cause the right ventricle to fail, which leads straight to hemodynamic instability and uh, shock. Okay, let's walk through the assessment. A patient arrives. You suspect a PE. What is the absolute first step? A, B, C, D, E assessment. Period. It's the filter that tells you everything. It's how you sort the stable from the unstable. And that distinction is everything. If they're unstable, the mortality risk is incredibly high, and stabilization has to come before anything else. So what does that unstable patient look like? What are the defining features? Usually it's caused by a massive embolus. You're seeing hemodynamic collapse, so severe hypotension, maybe the need for vasopressors. Your priority then is just keeping them alive. It's all about stabilizing the airway, breathing, and circulation. That's it. What are the immediate hands-on steps for that? Get intravenous access and get it now. You need to be ready with fluids or vasopressors. And monitoring? All of it. Automatic blood pressure cuff, chest leads for continuous cardiac monitoring, and a digital pulse oximeter. What are we aiming for with oxygen saturation? Is there a specific goal? Yes, you need to provide supplemental oxygen to keep their saturation above 90%. You mentioned severe hypotension. What other signs tell you the right ventricle is under extreme strain and shock is imminent? You'll see tachypnea, so really rapid breathing, and a heart rate that's, you know, well over 100 beats per minute, tachycardia. And in the absolute worst cases. In the most severe presentations, as the right ventricle fails, you can actually see them become bradycardic. Which is a terrible sign. It's a sign of impending arrest. Okay, the patient is unstable, time is out. What is the one imaging test you have to get? An emergent CT pulmonary angiography, a CTPA. That's the gold standard for seeing the clot. It's the fastest, most definitive way to visualize the filling defects in the pulmonary arteries. So the CTPA comes back positive for a massive <laughs> PE. When do you immediately reach for thrombolytics? If the patient has no significant bleeding risks, that's your next move. Medications like Alteplas can dissolve that clot very quickly. But what if they do have a high bleeding risk, say recent major surgery or uncontrolled hypertension? Ian, you have to pivot. Thrombolytics are off the table. So what are the options? You have to go in and get the clot. Surgical embolectomy or a percutaneous catheter-directed therapy are your best bets. Okay, that covers the crashing patient. Let's shift to the more common scenario, the stable patient. Once their vitals look okay, what's next? Now, you move to risk stratification. This means a really focused history and physical exam. Because their stability could be misleading. Absolutely. They might have mild symptoms or even no symptoms at all, so you can't get complacent. What are the classic symptoms you're looking for? The big ones are dyspnea, so shortness of breath, chloritic chest pain, pain that gets worse when they breathe in, and sometimes hemoptysis. Coughing up blood. Right. And you absolutely must check for signs of a deep vein thrombosis, leg pain, or swelling. And in that history, what risk factors are you trying to confirm? You're looking for things like recent immobilization, a long flight, bed rest, any recent orthopedic surgery, active cancer, or an indwelling catheter. What about lifestyle factors? Obesity, pregnancy, smoking, and oral contraceptive use are all major ones. Let's talk diagnostics. What's the most common finding on an electrocardiogram for a PE? By far, it's sinus tachycardia. The heart's just racing to compensate. But there's a less common but much more specific pattern, isn't there? Yes, the S1Q3T3 pattern. And when you see that, what does it tell you? It's a classic, though not always present, sign of severe right ventricular strain. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful signal. Okay, so you have the history, the exam, the electrocardiogram. How do you formalize the risk to decide what to do next? You use a scoring tool. 
the Wells criteria for pulmonary embolism. And this is designed to avoid unnecessary workups, right? Exactly. It helps you avoid sending every low probability patient for a CTPA, which has risks and costs. Let's break down the scoring. What are the highest weighted items? The two big ones are worth three points each. First, if you see clinical signs of a deep vein thrombosis. So an objective finding. Right. And second, if your clinical judgment says pulmonary embolism is the most likely diagnosis. So your own gestalt is actually part of the score. A huge part. It's weighted that heavily for a reason. Okay. What about the moderate factors? The 1.5 point items. Those are a history of a previous PE or DVT, a heart rate over 100, and recent surgery or immobilization within the last four weeks. And the one point factors. Hemoptysis and an active malignancy. You add it all up. So let's follow that score. What if the total is low probability, so less than two? For that group, mm. you then apply another tool before you even think about blood tests. The PERC criteria. The pulmonary embolism rule out criteria. It has eight elements. And if all eight are negative, you're done. You can safely rule out a PE right there. But if even one of those eight is positive. And PRC is not fulfilled, and you have to move to a blood test. Which is the D-dimer. You check the D-dimer. On that note, of those eight PRC elements, which one do you think gets overlooked the most in a busy setting? I'd say age over 50. It's so simple, but clinicians can get focused on trauma or hormones and forget that just being over 50 means you can't use PRC to rule out. Unilateral leg swelling is another one that sometimes gets missed. That's a great point. So let's say PRC fails. We get the D-dimer. What's the number that lets us stop the workup? If the D-dimer is less than 500 nanograms per milliliter, you can confidently rule out a PE in that low-risk patient. And what's the level that forces you to get imaging? 500 or above. That's the threshold. If it's at or over 500, you have to get a CTPA. That number is the gatekeeper. It's non-negotiable. Okay, what about a moderate probability well score, a total between 2 and 6? You skip PRC entirely. You go straight to a D-dimer. And it's the same cutoff. Same exact 500 nanograms per milliliter cutoff. If it's high, they get a CTPA. If it's low, you've ruled it out. And finally, the high probability patient, a well score above 6. What's the move? Here, your suspicion is so high, you start treatment before you even have a confirmed diagnosis. You start anticoagulation right away. Immediately. Usually with a direct oral anticoagulant, a DOAC, unless there's a contraindication. What would be a contraindication in that case? Severe hepatic impairment is a major one. And if you suspect a really big clot, a large embolus, would you still use a direct oral anticoagulant? You might choose something else. Heparin or fondoparinux can be better choices especially if you think you might need to reverse the anticoagulation or move to a more aggressive therapy. Let's say you get the CTPA, but it's inconclusive. Maybe the image quality is poor. What's the backup plan? The backup is a ventilation perfusion scan, a VQ scan. And the logic there is pretty simple. Very simple. If ventilation is normal, air gets in, but perfusion is poor, blood doesn't anstrake, that mismatch strongly suggests a PE. And how do you use that VQ scan result to make a final call? If you have a high probability VQ scan in a patient who already had a moderate or high well score, that's considered diagnostic. What if that's inconclusive too? You're still stuck in this gray area. Then you look for the source. You get a lower extremity compression ultrasound with Doppler. To look for a deep vein thrombosis. Right. And if you find a DVT in a patient with pulmonary symptoms, you make a presumptive diagnosis of PE and you treat. So once the diagnosis is confirmed, one way or another, what's the standard duration of treatment? All patients should be on anticoagulation for at least three months. A positive CTPA is the most direct route. A positive CTPA is confirmation. If you haven't started anticoagulation already, you start it now. You know, it's really the speed of these decisions that stands out. If you have a patient with mild symptoms who looks fine, but their well score is high, that structured approach completely changes their past. Yeah, it changes everything. Relying on these scores and that hard D-dimer cutoff of 500 protects you. It keeps low-risk patients from unnecessary tests and makes sure the high-risk ones get therapy immediately, sometimes before you even have a picture of the clot. That systematic approach is what saves lives. So, a final thought for you to consider. Think about that decision to start anticoagulation on a high-probability patient before you have proof. How does that initial commitment, based purely on clinical judgment, shape everything that comes after the imaging choices, the follow-up care? Think about that risk-benefit calculation you're making in that moment. 